sea can be a dangerous place. Even with modern ships and modern technology, disasters can still happen. Collision, fire, and foundering can all lead to abandonment. When human lives are at risk, all seafarers owe it to themselves and their colleagues to understand their responsibilities. This series has been produced to supplement your ship's personal survival manuals, including the SOLAS Chapter 3 training manual and STCW requirements. This video looks at muster lists and drills. It also examines helicopter operations. The first principle of safety at sea is that your ship is your best lifeboat. Do not leave it until it leaves you. Whatever happens, do not jump into the sea unless there is no alternative. Under the best conditions, the chances of surviving alone long enough to be found and rescued are very small indeed. Modern ships sink very rarely. Perhaps only one in 20 of those involved in major emergencies actually sinks, and usually there's time to prepare for evacuation. A ship's response to any emergency is twofold, to limit or control damage to the ship and to take care of the safety of the people on board. It is the muster list that specifies what each person on board must do in an emergency. It must be displayed in the engine room, the accommodation, and on the bridge. The muster list must give details of the general emergency alarm signal and the location of the muster or assembly stations. It must be kept up to date. And to ensure that everyone fully understands their duties, regular drills must be held. The muster list will also detail the special duty parties, including the firefighting and lifeboat preparation parties. For all key personnel, substitutes must be specified. For special duty parties, a responsible crew member must be designated as substitute leader. A substitute leader should regularly take charge of the special party during emergency drills to fully prepare him for the task. For firefighting parties, a major part of their job is to reduce the spread of flame and smoke. Closing doors will slow down the spread of flame and smoke. To make drills more worthwhile, a scenario of the emergency should be decided before the drill. This may involve blocking off certain areas, encouraging the special duty parties to think for themselves. To be effective, drills need to be credible. It's not effective to repeat the same old routines every time. The procedures used in any drill should always be the same as those that would be used in an emergency. In an emergency, there is likely to be time for a well-trained crew to respond so as to greatly increase their chances of survival. Good training and experience with the ship's equipment is essential. Emergencies often occur at night, so all deck crew must be aware of the special lights situated around the launching areas of the survival craft. On many ships, these lights are switched on at the bridge. These emergency lighting systems which must be installed at all muster stations and embarkation points, must be regularly checked and maintained. The muster list 
will show who is the designated GMDSS operator for external communications. Label no control, label no control, Catherine Delmas, radio check, please. It will also specify who is responsible for the use of the communication equipment in an emergency. Portable VHF radios can provide vital communication between the bridge and the area where the problem exists. In cold climates, if it's necessary to evacuate the ship, put on extra clothing. Most ships have some people on board who are not usually part of the crew and who will not be trained for emergency situations. Make sure that they attend drills. On passenger ferries and cruise ships, the situation is rather different. There are large numbers of passengers with little emergency or survival training. As fire doors and watertight doors will have been closed, even those passengers and crew who know their way around the ship may have difficulty getting to their muster stations. Stairway guides will be needed to show them the way and keep order in the passageways. In a real emergency, when everyone is under stress, some people may panic. To prevent this, crew members will need good emergency management training and strength of character. Showing understanding and being able to reassure and calm passengers will be a crucial part of preparing for the abandonment of a passenger ship. It is the duty of certain crew members specified on the muster list to ensure that all the passengers have correctly donned their life jackets. Standards for the performance, durability and wearing of life jackets are laid down in the SOLAS convention. Life jackets must be capable of being worn in only one way and being put on correctly within a period of one minute. They must keep the wearer afloat with the mouth above the water. They must be able to turn the body of an unconscious person face down in still water to a position with the mouth clear of the water in not more than five seconds. They must have a light source of a defined intensity that will last for at least eight hours. And a whistle. All jackets on any ship should be of the same make and type. Children need specially designed life jackets. If passengers are disabled or infirm, a crew member should be assigned to help them. If they need medication, they should take it with them. Another vital job is the gathering up and loading into the lifeboats of the essential equipment not stored in them. This may include the SART and EPIRBs. They should be taken on board and securely stowed in the lifeboat by the designated personnel. Extra water may also be useful. For once you have left the ship, there will be no more supplies until you are rescued. Being well prepared will count for a lot in any emergency situation. And that means knowing the life-saving equipment on your ship and knowing your duties and responsibilities. Your SOLAS Chapter 3 training manual will include instruction and information on all the life-saving appliances on board. There will be several copies. Generally, they're kept on the bridge, in the mess, and recreation rooms. They will be different on each ship. Soon after you join, you should take the time to read it. The ISM code is mandatory under SOLAS. It requires ships to have detailed procedures and checklists for all emergency situations. These documents have been developed from the practical experience acquired by seafarers.
they are there for your safety. You should be familiar with their requirements. Maintenance is a particularly important part of the life-saving regime on board. Solas specifies a weekly inspection that includes a check on the survival craft, the rescue boat and their launching devices. The muster list will specify the officer responsible. It is essential to check the lifeboats and their release gear thoroughly before any drill as although lifeboat exercises are a regular part of ship's life, accidents have occurred during these drills. Of the incidents mentioned in a recent report, 30% occurred on recovery, 26% on lowering, and 18% on stowing, the remainder having a wide range of causes. So recovery, Lowering and stowing are the operations that need extra care. To be able to release the lifeboat in heavy weather, release mechanisms are fitted that will operate either on load or off load. In other words, these systems can release the lifeboat when it is out of the water. They have built-in safeguards. The lifeboat crew must understand how they work and how to reset them. Proper maintenance is essential for these appliances. It is important that the release gear is properly reset and that the hooks are properly locked on recovery. Follow strictly the manufacturer's operating instructions. Any resistance during resetting the hooks should be a cause for concern and be investigated immediately. The officer in charge must be certain that the release system has been correctly reset before recovery. Lifeboat drills, complete with launching the lifeboat, can be done safely. It takes attention to detail and keeping strictly to the proper procedures set out in the boat's manual. There is a mandatory requirement for one abandoned ship drill every month. Records must be kept of these and any problems discovered must be noted and solved. Relief crew will always be given a safety briefing or familiarization tour, usually by the safety officer. They will be shown their muster or assembly station, their survival craft and its launching arrangements and told their emergency duties they must be told where the life boys are placed. It is important to know where the life boys with the buoyant lifelines are stowed. There will be one on each side of the ship. Half the life boys will have lights and two, usually carried on the bridge wings, will have a light and buoyant smoke signal attached. Deck crew and navigating officers should know how to operate the line throwing apparatus. This is usually stored on the bridge. The line must be able to go at least 230 meters in calm weather. There must be at least four lines and means of firing. In an emergency, the crew have a social responsibility to follow orders and work towards resolving the situation and minimizing the loss of life. How many meters uh, maximum range of this throwing? During the safety briefing, all personnel should feel free to ask questions. The more they know about the life-saving arrangements, the better prepared they will be. Today, it isn't enough just to know about the equipment on your ship. You have to know about helicopter recovery systems. In many emergency incidents, helicopters have played an important role in saving lives. Occasionally, ship's pilots and other personnel 
come on board by helicopter. The helicopter landing area must be cleared. Make sure that the area is clear of people and any objects that might be moved by the helicopter's downdraft. As large an area of deck as possible should be cleared. There must always be a fire crew in attendance. Helmets with chin straps in place must be worn. At night, good floodlighting of the area is vital. Some companies insist that the rescue boat is made ready before helicopter operations. The helicopter pilot has the primary responsibility for safety for all operations with his helicopter. He will only plan when he sees the ship, its course and the weather conditions. Uh, my speed now is uh, one eight knots. My course, my present course is one five zero. The wind speed, uh, westerly, ten knots. Yes, sir, Roger. India Juliet, copy. Good communication between the bridge and the helicopter pilot is essential in planning any helicopter operation. Always agree the ship's course with the helicopter pilot and do not alter it without informing him. Always plan your deck operations in advance, for when a helicopter is close, it's difficult to communicate. While the helicopter is winching, the pilot will be talking continually to his winchman and will only want to talk to the ship in case of emergency. So thorough planning before the operation begins is essential. Be aware that helicopters build up static electricity. So let any line from the helicopter ground on the ship or sea before you touch it. If you don't, the static shock can be sufficient to knock you out. This helicopter line has an extension to ensure that it grounds before the person on the line. Also, never secure any line from any helicopter to the ship. For ships in emergency situations near to shore, firemen, paramedics and doctors and specialist engineers can be winched on board to help the ship's crew. Depending on the type of helicopter, a winchman may descend to help those the helicopter is going to land or evacuate. This may not happen with small helicopters. So it is important you know how to use the various types of helicopter recovery gear. The rescue sling or strop is a common means for evacuating people. They can be made of different material but are all similar. The sling is put on over the head. Ensure that the loop of the sling is passed behind the back and under both armpits. You must face the hook while doing this. Tighten the strop by pulling the ring towards you. Keep your hands by your sides during winching. Do not hold the strop. Never unhook the sling or try to sit on it. Once you get to the helicopter door, do nothing. The helicopter crew will take care of you. It all happens very fast, too fast for you to be able to help them. When it comes to the evacuation of the injured, then the helicopter crew will always use their own equipment. A winchman will descend with it. Make sure that you understand the instructions given by the helicopter crew. Ask them to repeat them if necessary. For mass evacuation in an emergency, the helicopter crew may want to use a high line to better control the winching and to save time. High line is a line attached to the hook. The helicopter crew will give instructions. 
Having a line on the hook means that it can be brought on board much more quickly. Make sure no snags in it. In an emergency, make sure that everyone is standing by, ready to go. Helicopter evacuation takes place very quickly. Personnel cannot take any baggage of any kind with them during an evacuation. Usually, two people at a time will be lifted by the helicopter using two straps. The actions are the same as for the single strop. Tighten the strop by pulling the ring towards you and keep your hands by your sides. At the helicopter door, be guided by the winch operator. Once safely inside, step out of the strop. Do not try to take the strop off over your head, as this will be difficult in the confined space of the helicopter. Always obey the instructions of the helicopter crew. You may never be part of a major emergency at sea, but that is no reason not to prepare thoroughly. By doing so, you will ensure that should the worst occur, you will not let yourself or your colleagues down. Always ensure that you know your own responsibilities as designated by the muster list. Take the trouble to inform yourself about the life-saving equipment and emergency procedures on your ship. This video series explores many of the important procedures required for personal survival. Part 2 deals with enclosed lifeboats, freefall lifeboats and rescue boats. Part 3 with life rafts and open lifeboats. The fourth part deals with the issues of survival after evacuation. Watch all the relevant parts of this series and consult the study guide and your training manuals after you've done so. Take every opportunity to participate positively in all training courses and onboard drills or exercises. Training and knowledge.